Mr. Barry Gardner. Mr. Speaker, um, I have to admit that in the past mm. I have been known to fall asleep in this chamber during other members' speeches. Uh, that has not happened today, um, but I trust that I may be forgiven this evening if I happen to fall asleep in my own speech. Um, but after what is now seven hours in this chamber without a break, um, I feel for the first time it, it, it is actually quite likely. Um, Mr Speaker, we now know that it is Lord Strathclyde, and not the Right Honourable Member for Whitney, who will be leading the opposition charge into the next general election. Any piece of progressive legislation that this Labour government brings forward may be struck down by that noble Lord who has pronounced that it is, and I quote, too early to say which bills we will allow through. Yeah. How condescending. How outrageous that the Conservative Party are so brazen as to flaunt the fact that they intend to use the inbuilt majority which they have in the House of Peers to strike out the government's programme. So, so what is this programme that the Right Honourable Member for Whitney has reported today in the newspapers as having described as divisive and mere pettiness? I want to focus my remarks on two areas, health and education. I welcome the government's proposals to guarantee that all treatment for any illness should begin within 18 weeks of GP referral. I fail to see what is either petty or divisive about this. I welcome the government's proposals to guarantee that if your GP suspects you may have cancer, you will be entitled to see a cancer specialist within two weeks. I fail to see what is either petty or divisive about this. I also welcome the introduction of a right to a free health check every five years for those aged between 40 and 74. This is not petty. This is not divisive. It's what most people regard as common sense. It is, in fact, the opposite of divisive, because for the first time it guarantees a quality of health care for the many that previously has only been available to the few who could afford to pay. Empowering people by giving them guaranteed rights is not about division. It's about equality. No wonder then the party opposite, the party of Lord Strathclyde, wants to tear it down. My constituents remember only too well the last time they were in government. Treatment within 18 weeks? <laughs> Some chance. Their target was 18 months. And patients routinely waited much, much longer. 18 weeks was what it felt like if you were unlucky enough to have a visit to an accident and emergency department under the Tories. Now virtually all patients at a and &E are seen within four hours. The Conservatives had put the National Health Service into intensive care. It was this Labour government that invested in it and turned it around. In 1997, 50% of all hospital buildings in this country were over 100 years old. Today, over 50% of hospital buildings have been built since 1997. The NHS has gone from a poor service, where patients got what they were given, to a good service, where pa pa patients have rights, and the service is structured to suit them. Targets were important to drive up standards. Guarantees are important to lock in those reforms and to empower patients. As targets become rights, not just the patient, but our society is healed. More equal, 
less divisive. Her Majesty's gracious speech was right. The Lord Strathclyde is wrong. I turn now to education. Today's headline in the Daily Telegraph was the most extraordinary mixture of outrage and incredulity. So what did it say? Merely this. Children get legal right to a good education. That was it. That was the headline. How outrageous indeed. Children having a right to a good education? What? All children? Not just the rich who can pay for private education and enshrine that right in a legally binding contract? How preposterous! No wonder they condemned the government's proposal as a Whinger's charter. No doubt they say the same about the contract that parents sign with Eton and Harrow, Winchester and Ampleforth, Fettis and Gordonston as well. Whinger's charters, all. So just how petty and divisive are the educational guarantees that Lord Strathclyde wants to strike down. I welcome the fact that all 7 to 11 year olds falling behind are guaranteed to receive one-to-one -one tuition in English or maths. I fail to see what is either petty or divisive about this. Perhaps their opposition aren't concerned to see primary children fall behind with their classmates. But parents are. They want government to be just as concerned as they are, and they want government action to help sort it out. I welcome the proposal to guarantee all 5 to 16-year-olds access to five hours of high-quality physical activity and sport each week. I fail to see how this is either petty or divisive. Children at private schools have always had that guarantee. Giving it to all children is about equality, not division. It's about doing something positive to address the growing problems of childhood obesity. I welcome the guarantee that every teenager should be in either education or training, at least until the age of 17 from 2013, and at least until the age of 18, from 2050. How is this petty, when that youngster's future prospects will depend upon the skills and qualification he or she secures before the age of 20? How is this petty, when our country's productivity and prosperity depends upon us preparing our young people for the jobs that tomorrow's economy will require. My constituents well remember the last time the Conservatives controlled education both in the country and in Brent. In 1995, the Audit Commission report for London said of Brent schools, and I quote, Brent schools are simply the worst. In those days, schools in my constituency regularly struggled to achieve even 40% A star to C at GCSE. Just one example is Wembley High Technology College. That used to achieve only 32%. This year, it achieved 92% A star to C at GCSE. I am hugely proud of them, and I pay tribute to their extraordinary head, Jill Bow, who this year was the runner-up as Woman of the Year in the Leadership and Diversity Awards for her work in improving the life chances of so many young people from so many and varied backgrounds. And there are other schools in my constituency that I can equally well name. St Gregory's, where I will be attending the award ceremony tomorrow night. 
Claremont, Preston Manor, JFS, Kingsbury High School. All, all of them, with A star to C achievements in the 80 to 90% bracket. That's the transformation that has been made in my constituency in education. Perhaps most indicative of what things were like was in 1996 when the Conservatives in Brent set the Council's budget. They entirely omitted to put a single penny into special educational needs. Statutory responsibility, yet not one penny allocated in their budget. My constituents know what is petty. No funding for the most disadvantaged children. That was petty. No funding for the most disadvantaged children. My constituents know what is divisive. No funding for disadvantaged children. That was divisive. Petty and divisive. A precise description of what Conservative Party policy on education was all about. Mr Speaker, this Queen's speech is absolutely right to talk about the need for action on climate change and absolutely right to look forward to COP15 in Copenhagen next month. I had the privilege with a number of honourable members of attending the Globe Forum on Climate Change and Energy in Copenhagen last month. And there I chair the Commission of Globe on Land Use and Ecosystems. And so it was with particular pleasure that I listened earlier this evening to the remarks by the honourable member, the right honourable member for Penrith and the Borders, who was speaking as he informed the House in what would be his last Queen's speech debate before leaving the Commons. And he spoke of the need to preserve rainforests. And the proposals that will go forward from the Copenhagen COP <coughs> next month are absolutely critical in the way in which reduced emissions from deforestation and degradation can tackle the issue of climate change. By 2020, if the world is to achieve a 450 parts per million trajectory, we have to reduce annual emissions by 17 gigatons each year of CO2. That is 17 gigatons from business as usual, but only 5 gigatons can actually be achieved at a cost of less than 60 euros per ton from the developed world. The irony and injustice of that will be patent to everyone in this chamber. What it means is that 12 gigatons of that abatement have to be achieved from the developing world, and they are the ones who, of course, did not create the problem in the first place. It is absolutely essential that the post-2012 settlement, when the Kyoto Protocol comes to its conclusion, should have as part of it a red process to reduce the emissions from deforestation and degradation. But to date, 
The red process that has been talked about by governments is, I fear, inadequate to the task. Because what it does is it offers a method for paying governments to reduce their emissions. But that is like boarding a train without knowing the destination. Because, of course, each country must be assumed to act in its own economic best interest. And therefore, it will seek to maximize the revenue it can accrue from the minimum num amount of emissions reductions over the longest period of time. That is what any sensible, economic, rational agent would do. But the world does not need the process of emissions reductions spun out over as long a period as possible. It needs early and dramatic reductions in emissions. And that is why in setting the framework for RED at Copenhagen next month, it is absolutely essential that the argument be made to ensure that the financial weighting of the package that supports RED will incentivize early and dramatic reductions and will then also reward a transition to a stabilized point of zero net emissions. Unless it is clear that the RED process has that end point, then we cannot hope to achieve the reductions in emissions that are required to get the world on a 450 parts per million track. So, as a Deputy Speaker, it is essential also that there be a stabilisation fund as part of the RED negotiations. A stabilisation fund that will show countries just why it is in their own self-interest to arrive at a point of zero net emissions. Only if there is such a stabilisation fund will we see countries make the necessary transition that's required to achieve the results on climate change that the world hopes Copenhagen may bring. Mr Speaker, The issue of equitable life has been before this Parliament and its predecessors now for almost 10 years. And whilst it is right and proper that we should have talked about the things that the Queen's speech contains, it is also important to mention the things that it has not addressed. And it was interesting when we were hearing earlier from a gentleman on the opposition bench, I can't remember which honourable member it was now, who was talking about the need to look at those who had been innocent victims, uh, imprisoned, um, and then subsequently uh, released because they were found to have been innocent, and the compensation that should be made available to those people. And the Honourable Member used the phrase that, tragically, many are now dying off before that compensation is able to be paid. In equitable life, we don't have a few miscarriages of justice with people suffering and not being in receipt of compensation before they die. We have literally tens of thousands of people who have suffered because of poor regulation as well as from maladministration of that company, but for whom compensation is undoubtedly due 
and unfortunately many of those people are dying before it is possible for them to receive that compensation. I believe it is a major failing in this Queen's speech and it has been a major failing of this government that we have not moved far more swiftly to address their plight. It is quite simply wrong that those people are struggling in their old age without the financial support that they believed they were going to receive, that indeed they had spent their lives saving for. Now finding themselves in penury and finding themselves, <coughs> many of them, dying before they are able to get what they deserve. Mr Speaker, in the minutes that remain to me, I want to bring to the House's attention the single most distasteful thing that I have experienced as the Member of Parliament for Brent North. Two days ago, I received an email from a friend of mine, Pana Vakaria, who urged me to go on to a website and uh, action a YouTube video. That YouTube video was a promotional video for the Welsh British Nationalist Party. It was in my constituency that it was filmed. It started with an image of Wembley Football Stadium. And the camera was then driven through Wembley High Street, focusing, focusing on people of African descent, of Indian descent, focusing on people whose dress would indicate that they were Muslim, focusing on people whose dress would indicate that they were Hindu. It then stopped outside of the mosque on Ealing Road and focused on the sign of the Muslim Welfare Centre that stands there. And all the time, the presenter, who was this individual from the British National Party, was saying, look at that. That's not what Britain should be. That's not what Britain is like. That is not what Britain should have been allowed to become. I found this the single most revolting thing and the most disturbing thing uh, in my life as a constituency MP. And I issue a challenge now to the British National Party Come. Come back to Brent. Come back to Brent North. Dare. Dare to stand against me at the next general election. Dare to put what you said on film to the whole of the British public. Dare to put it to the people of Brent North. Because you claimed, you claimed that those individuals that your camera focused on were not British. Well, I refute that. Those people are British. They are proud to be British. They are proud to be part of this society. And I am proud to represent the most multicultural borough in this country and indeed in Europe. We have over 160 different first languages spoken in our borough. Over 130 different first languages spoken in our schools. We are proud of that. And we are proud of the fact that by the time those children reach the time to go to secondary school, they are achieving above the national average at Key Stage 2. Every single one of the schools in Brent North. 
These children are our future, Mr Speaker. So I defy the British National Party to come to Brent, to come to Brent North, to stand at the next election, because, of course, they believe these people are not even entitled to vote. But they are. They're here. They're British citizens. And it is absolutely essential that in the Queen's speech that we will be voting on in a few days' time, there is an equalities bill. And at the core of what we do in this place, equality must form the essential heart of British public life and British politics. I was speaking to a woman in my constituency who is second generation. Um, her parents came from East Africa in the 1970s, but the family originally was from uh, India. And she was telling me about the discussion that they had had in her family over the dinner table of the appearance on question time of the representative <coughs> from the British National Party. And she told me how she and her husband had been trying to explain to their children that it was important that there should be free speech. They had been intellectualising about how important it was that in a democracy people should be able to, without fear, express their views, state their views clearly, and that other people should be able to argue with them rationally and defeat them in a rational debate. But what impressed me most was that her daughter, who was born here, who has been a British citizen her entire life, simply said, why should they be allowed to go on television and question the fact that I am British? And all the intellectualising all the fine words about freedom of speech and the importance of debate were knocked to one side by that young girl. And the sense of outrage that she had that a fellow member of her own society, of her own country, could question her right to be other than what she was. So, Mr. Speaker, the British National Party, I believe, have no basis in this society. They have defiled my constituency by coming into it in the way that they did. And I issue once again the challenge to them. Come, put up or shut up, but don't dare don't dare to speak about my constituents in the way that you did on that YouTube. Mr Speaker, it's a privilege always to be able to address the House. When you're the last speaker after seven hours, you're able to do it at greater length than otherwise uh, you might find yourself so doing. But... Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity that uh, being the last in this debate has given me, and I thank you and the House for it.